Om Sang Saraswati Namaha. Namaste. Namaste. This is his session we're going to speak about the curses of Jaya and Vijaya. Oh, once upon a time, the four Kumars, that was Sanat, Sanaka, Sananda, and Sanat Kumar, went to Boykunta, the home of Lord Vishnu, and they were desirous of having an audience with the Lord. But when they arrived, they found the gate to the house was barred, and Joya and Vijaya were standing beside the entrance, protecting the privacy of the Lord. We have come to see the Lord, stated the four brothers. We are sorry, replied Joya and Vijaya, but the Lord is inside the inner apartments enjoying some private time with the goddess Lakshmi and no one may enter to disturb them. The four brothers explained, uh, we are pure devotees of the Lord and there is no time when the Lord will not make himself available to pure devotion. Therefore, please inform the Lord that we have come and that we request an immediate audience with him. Joya and Vijaya again barred the way. Our Lord is such a busy man, always fighting with Asuras or attempting to satisfy devotees. He hardly ever enjoys an opportunity to relax alone with his wife. But why don't you come back tomorrow? The four brothers grew impatient. Uh, we realize that you are only performing your duty and trying to serve the Lord. However, even with the best of intentions, no one has the authority to separate a pure devotee from the Lord. Therefore, we will certainly curse you. Now, but because you have committed error in the performance of your service of the Lord, you, we will let you decide the nature of the curse. You can choose between seven births in the family of Rishis or three births in the family of Asuras. <laughs> and Joya and Bijoya considered the decision. Seven births in the world of mortal beings is too long to be away from heaven. It would be better to take three births in the form of Asuras and get it over with quickly. Then the four brothers took some water from the Ganga and pronounced the curse, be born as Asuras for three births. They threw the water upon Joya and Bijoya, who were destined to manifest in the world. Modu and Kweitla. This is the beginning of the chanting. The first birth they took was in the form of the brothers Modu and Kweitla, otherwise known as too much and too little, who attempted to slay Brahma as he sat in the lotus of Vishnu's navel. Too much and too little have mandated action for all existence, and at no time will they allow an individual to be still. If one has too much, he has to get up and get rid of some. If one has too little, then he must get some more. Uh, Vishnu was deep in the mystic sleep of divine union at the time, so Brahma sang a hymn of praise to the divine mother, Yoganidra, the goddess of mystic sleep, in order to awaken him from his sleep and alert him to the attack. For 5,000 years, Lord Vishnu fought with those two Asuras. Realizing that they were invincible, he began to pray to the Divine Mother to show him how to defeat them. The Divine Mother promised that she would trap them by the excesses of their egotism. <laughs> See how often we get trapped by the excesses of our egotism. And then Vishnu said to those two Asuras, I am extremely pleased with your prowess in battle. I wish to offer it a boon. Choose from me a boon. 
And those Asuras, Madhu and Koitaba, replied, Ah, Vishnu, it is always the stronger that grants boons to the weaker. And seeing that we are stronger than you and you have no way of defeating us, then it is you who should beg a boon from us. Go ahead and ask. Whatever you request, you shall not be denied. Vishnu requested, I want to know from both of you the means of your death. Being tricked by the Divine Mother, the Asuras replied, you can only slay us where there is no water. But you see, the whole world is flooded, so there is nowhere we can be slain. And Vishnu then took them on his lap, and expanding his universal form, he killed them with his discus. So here the water means it represents the Sansar Samudra. Show it, you can kill us a place where there isn't a flood of this ocean of all. Wherever there's not the ocean of all, but you see, wherever you go in the gross body, there's the ocean of all. Wherever you go in the subtle body, there's the ocean of all. And Vishnu took him, took the two asuras and put him on his lap. In the causal body, there was only one. And then he cut off their heads. And too much and too little were put into balance. Hiranyaksha oh, and Hiranyakoshipu and the story of Pala. The next incarnation of Joya and Vijaya came in the form of the brothers Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakoshipu. Hiranyaksha hid the earth underneath the sea of waters. All creation called out to Lord Vishnu to take birth in order to save the earth. Now well, here's all the earth was submerged underneath the water. It was a flood. Vishnu came as a boar, dove down beneath the waters of the sea, and lifted the earth upon his tusks. He placed the earth upon the waters and killed the demon Hiranyakshinba. Then the brother Hiranyakashipu reigned in his place. Hiranyakashipu had won the boon that he could not be slain in the day, nor could he be slain at night. He could not be slain inside, nor could he be slain outside. He could not be slain by man, nor could he be slain by beast. He could not be slain by any weapons known to man. And with the strength of that boon, Hiranyakoshipu conquered the earth and the heavens. Then he made a law that no other should be worshipped but himself. I am the Lord. He imprisoned all the rishis, destroyed their temples, and made everyone worship him. Aren't we all doing that time and time again? Hey, look at me. Honor me. Recognize me. The king was blessed with a beautiful son named Prahlad. Prahlad was a divine child, and the first word to come out from his mouth was Vishnu. The king became very angry with his wife. Where did my son learn a word like that? You had better see to his proper education. I will not have such blasphemies uttered in my house. No one will say the name of my arch enemy. As the child grew up, he loved to sit for worship and very much enjoyed singing devotional songs to the Lord. The king summoned the schoolmaster. Teach my child the proper ways of Asura behavior. I don't know who put these faulty ideas in his head about worship, meditation, and the respect for the gods, but you had better teach him that I am the only one to be worshipped. You make him forget all this stuff about Vishnu. The teachers took him to the school. Now class, 
We are born of the Asura race and it is our duty to remember that these bodies that we wear are to be pleased at all times. The only worship that is ordained for Asuras is the worship of our king and we have no responsibilities in life other to enjoy through our senses as much as possible. <laughs> this is the mark of a true Asura. Recess, Prahlad went into the play yard with the other children. I've got a great game to play, he said. Let's pretend we are Rishis meditating upon the Lord. <laughs> he showed all the other children how to meditate. He even tied his hair into a top knot, and the children performed worship just like the Rishis. O oh, king, O oh, king, cried the schoolmaster. You had better get your son out of my school. He is corrupting all the other students. He teaches them about the gods, about puja and meditation. At recess, he has them performing all the things that we instruct against. Please take that child out of my school for him before he infects all the other children. The king called his son Talad. My son, why can't you be like all the other children? Why is it you are always getting into trouble? When will you learn to be a good Ashura and respect the laws and customs of our society? Father, responded the young Talad, I never did anything that was against Dharma. I never performed any behavior that was disrespectful to the Lord. What is the complaint against me? What Lord is it that you are seeking to please? Asked the king. Everyone knows that there is only one God of creation, Father. And what is the name by which you call this God? He has so many names. But I call him Vishnu, replied the son. Vishnu, my arch enemy, how dare you say that name in my house? Anyone who speaks that name in my kingdom shall be punished with death. Father, how can you be so antagonistic to the Lord? God will protect any devotee who surrenders to him. And who is that God, asked the father? Vishnu, replied Prahlad. <laughs> Captain of the guard, called the king. Take this sinner to the top of the mountain and throw him off from the highest peak. Make sure he will fall to his death. We will see what God can save you when this living God standing before you has decreed your death. The soldiers escorted Prahlad to the highest peak of the mountain. Before pushing him from the summit, the captain requested, Do you have any last words? Prahlad proclaimed, Jay Vishnu! <laughs> and the soldiers pushed him from the top. Just as Prahlad fell into the space below, Vishnu sent his eagle, Garud, to catch the child in midair. They flew a couple of loops before the soldiers and glided gently to the ground. We tried to throw him from the mountain, my lord, stammered the captain of the god, but Vishnu's carrier, that eagle, came in the path and saved him. Then tie him up in chains and throw him into the sea, yelled the fa royal father. The captain of the guard escorted the prisoner to the side of the ocean and made his soldiers tie heavy chains to Prahlad's body. The captain requested, Do you have any last words? Prahlad proclaimed, Jai Vishnu! And the soldiers pushed him into the water. Prahlad sank to the bottom. Seeing his devotee in the depths of peril, Lord Vishnu became a fish, the Matsya Avatar. 
The giant fish swam to where Pallad lay, hooked the chain around his fin, and quickly swam to the surface, leaving the boy on the shore. Maharaj, stammered the captain of the guard, even the sea won't take this child of yours. Now what shall be done with him? The king looked in amazement. Then he called his sister Holika. Holika had won the boon from the divine fire that nothing could burn her. Holika, take Prahlad into your arms and hold him in a raging fire so that he will be burned. The soldiers lit the fire and Holika hugged Prahlad to her bosom and then jumped into the fire. Prahlad closed his eyes and recited the names of Vishnu. The flames rose up and completely engulfed them. Prahlad continued his japa. When he opened his eyes, he found that the fire had burned his aunt, but he did not even feel the heat. And even to this day, we celebrate the salvation of Prahlad and the death of Holika with the festival of Holi. It usually comes in March, uh, sometimes late February, but usually in Hiranyakashipu was enraged with anger. Was there nothing that could kill this child? Where does this God wish to live that you have the faith that he will protect you from every circumstance? He asked of his son. Vishnu lives everywhere, replied the young devotee. Does he even live in the pillars of the palace? The king, mighty king, drew his sword. Yes, Father, he will be found even in the pillars of the palace, replied Talad. The king struck the pillar with all his might. The stone and plaster cracked and crumbled with a tremendous roar, falling to the ground, revealing a great being sitting upon a throne within. He was neither man nor animal. He was half man, half lion, and he was terribly frightful. Hiranyakashipu ran for the door. When he reached the threshold, he could see that it was dusk. The sun was just setting. It was neither day nor night. Then that great beast Narsing, half man, half lion, grabbed hold of the king and dragged him across the threshold where he was neither inside nor was he outside. And using the claws of his hands, the avatar of Vishnu tore open the stomach of Hiranyakashipu and drank the blood. Prahlad sang hymns in praise of Lord Vishnu and throughout the reign of King Prahlad, there was peace and prosperity in their land. Well, here is a really fun story about Ekavir and Ekavali. One day, Lord Vishnu entered the inner, inner apartments of Vaikuntha, where he saw Lakshmi peering out from the window. He called to her, but she didn't pay any attention. She merely stood gazing out the window. Lakshmi called Vishnu, what are you looking at? Lakshmi was so attentive to what she was looking at that she was not even aware that the Lord had entered. Lakshmi, Vishnu called again, where are you? No response. Watch me! Vishnu called again. What are you looking at with such rapt attention that you even ignore your own husband? You forget the presence of your Lord? Vishnu came close to the window and looked out to see the Uchrishrava horse, the horse of wisdom, which was produced from the churning of the milk ocean flying across the sky. Oh, Lakshmi, if you are so enamored of horses, you go down to earth and become a horse.
horse. Vishnu grew angry. Oh my lord, what did you say? inquired the amazed Lakshmi. I said, go down to earth and become a horse, replied the angry Vishnu. Why would you have me do that? For such a small fault of mine, you were giving me such a grievous curse. We have some karma to perform. <laughs> How shall I be free of this curse, inquired Lakshmi? When the time is right, I will come as a stallion, and we will have a child who is destined for greatness. Lakshmi went down to the earth in the form of a mare. Day and night she repeated the mantras of Lord Vishnu and searched for the appearance of her Lord. In this way, 100,000 years passed. Om Kling Vishnu Nama. She could not figure out where Vishnu was or what could possibly be keeping him so long. Finally, she got an idea. She said, Om Namah Shivaya. <laughs> and immediately, Lord Shiva appeared. Hello, Lakshmi, Shiva extended his greetings. What are you doing down here in the form of a horse? Where is Lord Vishnu? I've been waiting for Vishnu to show up for the last 100,000 years, replied an impatient Lakshmi. Then why did you call me, inquired Shiva. Shiva, I must tell you the truth. One day, Lord Vishnu was sitting in deep meditation. For a long time, he did not move in the least. He merely sat there, fully absorbed. When he awoke, I asked him, Deva Deva, Jagannath, God of all gods, Lord of the universe, everyone looks to you for solace and protection. All existence meditates upon you. Upon whom were you meditating? And then my Lord answered me, My beloved Lakshmi, I was meditating upon the Lord Shiva. Verily, he is my inner self. That is why Shiva, when after 100,000 years of chanting Vishnu, that is why Shiva, when after 100,000 years of chanting Vishnu's name and he didn't show up, I thought to call you. Well, what can I do for you, Lakshmi? asked Shiva. Please remind my Lord that I'm waiting for him as per his command. Uh, Shiva went to Vaikuntha and said, Hello, Vishnu. What has happened to you? You look terrible, like there's no Lakshmi in your house. It seems that you haven't washed your dishes in a long, long time. <laughs> Where is your beloved wife? Vishnu was stunned into remembrance. Shiva, if you if, must please excuse me, I have a very important function I must attend to honor. Vishnu excused himself and went down to the earth where he became a stallion. Lakshmi saw the stallion and recognized him immediately. They gave birth to a beautiful son. Come, Lakshmi, said Vishnu, let us return to Boykunta. Have you no heart? How can we leave this poor, defenseless baby alone? Our karma here is complete. Let's go home, the Lord repeated. Lord, I can't leave my child like this, answered Lakshmi. Okay, replied Vishnu, and he, he turned the baby horse into a human. Now let's go. With that, he rose into the atmosphere and headed towards Boykunt. Lakshmi took one last look at her child and followed her husband home. Just then, 
the king Torwashu came riding a chariot before his army. Who has abandoned that child alone and in the wilderness? Wondered the king. What a beautiful boy. I have been practicing asceticism for the last 100 years in order to have a divine son. Certainly this is the son which God has promised. I shall take him home and raise him as my own. The king lifted the child into his chariot and returned to his home. He raised that boy until he became a well-educated and well-mannered warrior of superior prowess. He was known as Ekabir, the warrior of union, or he who has one-pointed attention. He's Ek and he's Birya. He's got beer bob, he's, a, he's the warrior, he's a hero. He's striving to maintain that unity in the one. Turboshu performed all the rites of passage for his son and saw to his education. And when he was convinced that Ekaviriga was fully qualified, he placed his son on the throne to become ruler of the land and with his wife went to perform tapasya in the forest. So Turbashu gave up the kingdom to Ikaviria. The king Rabia had a beautiful daughter named Ekavali, the spirit of union. She was born from the divine fire at the time of sacrificial offering. The princess Ekavali loved to play among the flowers, and every day she would move with her friends outside the city gates to play among the wild flowers by the bank of the river. The king informed his daughter that he worried for her safety, and he built a beautiful garden within the palace for her to play. But Ekavali found the garden too tame, and once again wandered outside to play. Then the king sent an escort of soldiers to guard the girls as they played outside the city gates. One day, the wicked king Kalaketu, the purveyor of darkness, Jisko Kala Kachaskarbe, he is he is the cultivator of darkness. The purveyor of darkness, he came to where the girls were playing. <laughs> Seeing the beauty of the princess, he and his soldiers attacked the guards. Having caught the guards unaware, they were overwhelmed by his superior force, and Kalakitu stole the princess, Ekavali. Kalakitu held her prisoner in his palace towers along with her friend Yoshawati. Uh, she was the spirit of all welfare. Yosh, just go yash the pushti He ordered Ekamali to marry him, but the princess would not agree. She cried and cried, what shall we do? She asked Yashawati. Yashawati replied, I know the mantra ring, the mantra of the divine mother goddess. I shall make japa, and she will make my path clear so that I can summon help. Yashuvati began to read the repetition of the mantra. Suddenly the doors flew open and Yashuvati made her escape. She ran through the dark of night, and by morning she had reached the bank of the river. And there she sat upon a rock, crying, wondering which way she should turn for help. Just then, a handsome young prince came riding before a great army. Oh, fair maiden, why are you crying? No one should be sad in this kingdom, especially while I am ready to serve you. My friend and I were stolen by the wicked king Kalakithi. He defeated our guards and took us prisoners and locked us up in the palace tower. I was able to escape, but the princess Ekalali 
is still held prisoner. The wicked king keeps saying that she must marry him, but she tells him that from her childhood, the astrologers told her that she was destined to mar marry a man named Ekabir, explained the Ashwati. I am Ekabir, declared the prince. <laughs> Where is the palace of the wicked king? I am ready to engage him in war. I shall free my wife and rid the earth of darkness. No, my prince. First you must become well armed. Seek initiation from Guru Dathatreya in the Three Loki Tilaka, the mantra which is the highest expression of the three worlds. Then we shall go to fight. Ekavirya bowed before Dattatreya. Guruji, please initiate me in the mantra of the Triloki Tilakam, by which I can slay the wicked king Kalakit, the purveyor of darkness, and free my wife. Dattatreya explained. Hring, the totality of Maya. Gori, she who is rays of light. Rudra, the reliever of sufferings. Actually, Asru Trayate, Iti Rudra, who takes away the tears. Daite, the giver of compassion. Yogeshwari, the supreme lord of union. Whom cut the ego, flat. Purify, Swaha, I am one with God. Go, my son, Dathatreya said in blessing. Defeat the evil king. Ringauri Rudra Dagite, Yogeshwari Hum Fat Swaha. Ekavirya marched into battle and defeated the wicked purveyor of darkness, King Kalakit. He freed the captured princess, Ekavali, and when Yeshulati explained to her friend all that had happened, she asked Ekavir, please take me to my father. He will bless our marriage according to the customs of our family. Then Ekavir returned Ekavali to her family, and the king Rambia and his family celebrated the divine marriage in accordance with all the traditions of their ancestors. Ekabiria and his divine consort Ekavali established the worship of the Divine Mother in their kingdom and set new ideals of respect during their reign. Their son's name was Kritavirya and his son was Kartavirya and thus were the origins of the High High Dynasty of Kings. Uh, and uh, the Haihaya was a very famous bumps, a famous uh, dynasty of kings, just like the Surya bumps and the Chandra bumps. The Haihayas uh, were, were descended from Ekavirya. We have one uh, uh, time for one more. Bishwarat conquers India. There was once a great king named Kodhe who had a tremendous dominion, and he was a very righteous and dharmic king. Gande had a very noble son whose name was Bishwarat. When Bishwarat grew up to a suitable age, the king Gande said, Son, I have decided to retire to the forest to practice tapasya for the rest of my days. And you know, that was the tradition. Everyone waited until their children were responsible so that they could quickly give the kingdom to their children and go off and be free from the responsibilities of administration. And today we say, if you are a good boy and a good girl and you mind your P's and Q's, I may give it to you in my will after I'm gone. <laughs> But before the tradition was, do it as quickly and efficiently as possible and go and do tapasya. You've done your share. Let the next generation take over. Please take over the 
responsibilities of maintaining and protecting this kingdom, I am going to devote the rest of my life to spiritual discipline. Bishwarup answered, Father, the first duty of a son is to fulfill the desires of his father and in every way possible assist the father in attaining emancipation. Therefore, if it be your wish that I take over the kingdom, I have nothing further to say. But please discuss this matter with our gurus and your ministers. Present this matter before the people and let them determine whether or not they want me to be their king. Sounds like a reasonable reply. Gandhi thought, what a noble son I have. He called the gurus of the land, the Brahmins, and the representatives of the people of his kingdom, and he said, I wish to devote myself to the path of self-realization during my last years on earth. I have decided to retire to the forest and lead a life of asceticism, where I can practice meditation and contemplate a religious life free from the responsibilities of being a king. I have determined that my son, Bishwara, shall become the king in my place. And all the people assembled, everyone shouted, Bishwara Ki Jai! What a noble king we have! What a great example we have! What a wonderful son we will have as a ruler! And the people unanimously acknowledged Bishwara as the king of their country. Gade retired to the forest with his queen and there began to practice tapasya. After some time, Vishwarat began to think, a king of the warrior class is successful only insofar as he can expand the frontiers of his kingdom. It is not just sufficient that I have received this nation as an inheritance from my father who built it for me. Shall I pass the same thing on to my children? I must add to the inheritance that I have received from my ancestors. Only then can I pass on my legacy to my own son. He called together all the learned and wise men of his kingdom and said, I have decided to go to war and expand the borders of my kingdom. All the gurus and sannyasis, the brahmins and sadhus, unanimously said, King, please don't do that. We are healthy, wealthy, and living in peace. We have abundance. Why will you go to war? If you take all the men from the fields to be soldiers in your army, who will harvest the crops? Bishwarat didn't listen. He said, my dharma as a Kshatriya king is to fight. I must fight and fulfill my dharma. What kind of fame and glory will I receive if I only take my father's inheritance and pass it down to my children? No one will remember that act. Only if I increase my family's wealth, valor, fame, will I be remembered. Take all the farmers and conscript them into the army. Be prepared to march off to war. By orders of the king, all the male citizens were conscripted into the army and trained for war. Bishwarat marched off in conquest. In a short time, he subjugated all the neighboring kingdoms and moved across the empire to conquer all of India. Victory after victory, he marched forward until no one knew the limits of his kingdom. Only after taking tribute from many kings and taking the crowns from the heads of many princes, he was satisfied, and then he turned around and headed towards home. Washishta's cow. Oh, let's stop right here and see if there are any questions. Please. So we, we discussed too much and too little earlier on. Yes. Uh, I was uh, 
thinking that if you are a wandering sannyasin, there's a traditional sannyasin who wandered around the country. Yes, it's called Puri Braj. Uh, continually uh, uh, traveling. And for these people, uh, this problem of too much and too little would not be there. But, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Always it's there. And that's why the saying is so appropriate. Ek ekant. Do aram teen rajniti char haram. Uh, there's this famous proverb. One is ekant, the bliss of sat. But it's very difficult because if you sit in the forest, every time you want to go to town, to the nearby bazaar and bring something more, you have to take everything you own with you and then carry that plus the new things back. So then they say, do aram. Two is very comfortable because one person can stay there and watch the stuff you've got and the other person can go to town and bring some more. Time to time, you need provisions. Teen Rajniti. If there are three, there's, a, there's politics because there's a, a, a vote for every decision. Who will go? Who will stay? Uh, uh, who, what will you bring back? And what won't you bring back? All of these things have to be agreed on and there is always a two to one vote. Char. If you have four, you have nothing but pandemonium and confusion. <laughs> because then there's always two against two. <laughs> and there's a debate again about over every decision. Now, the reason that this is so applicable, because if you have too much, you can't carry it all to the bazaar and carry more back with you. If you have too little, well, you gotta go. <laughs> Now, what's the right amount for a sadhu? Even it may be, uh, what kind of chimta will you have in the forest? These are the chimtas of a sadhu who sits in one temple. Those are the chimtas of a sadhu. Uh, uh, Gautam, uh, uh, please pick up those uh, 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 chimtas, please, okay. and hand them to me. Thank you very much. These are the chapters of a wandering sadhu. Uh, you can see the difference. <laughs> uh, this weighs about one or one and a half kilos, and this weighs about four kilos. <laughs> and walk around with too much or too little. These are too little to administer a major fire like the, uh, the one we have here. These are too much to walk around. Same decision every sadhu has to make for everything he or she carries with uh, him or her into the forest. Too much and too little always apply, no matter what the quantity that we're talking about, what the commodity we're talking about. Are there other questions? Swami, you talked about the Sanat Kumaras. Yes. And that nobody has the authority to separate the Lord from his devotees. Correct. Um, what does this actually mean when you say separation? And can somebody else outside do it? No one can separate a devotee from his ishta. No other individual can intercede. If we want to go and meet our darshan of our ishta devo, there is no one who has the authority to prohibit that, that darshan. It's a very personal relationship and no one can come intercede between a devotee and God. And that's, that's the meaning. Sanji, question uh, from Kumari. Yes, Kumari Ma. Uh, the Chandi has presented evil in a subjective way as incorrect thinking, asuras and identification as through ego. Other Puranic stories seem to represent a more cosmic independent of mankind. Example, Hiranyakashipu, who opposes God in a more absolute way, which is correct. 
Well, they're, they're both correct, Kumar Imam, that the ego is what uh, it separates us from God. It's in opposition to God. It says, I am different or distinguished from God. So here on Yakashipu was saying, not only am I separate from God, but I am the God. Uh, I am the only one to be worshipped. Don't think about other gods. Just think about me. And that was more ego than divinity. None of the gods. Vishnu says that Shiva is verily my inner self. Shiva says, I always worship Vishnu. Uh, they work together. Hiranyakashivu says, hey, don't go to Vishnu and don't go to Shiva. Just come to me. So that's the difference in the manifestation of ego, but both are, are malicious in that they both keep us away from that ultimate unity with divinity. Question from Rolf from Mountain View. Namaste, Rolf. Why was it a sin for Lakshmi to be captivated by Uchchasravas if he symbolizes wisdom? Rolf, the reason is because Vishnu symbolizes infinite consciousness. And Vishnu was calling to his wife Lakshmi and she was so mesmerized by looking at wisdom that she couldn't even recognize consciousness. The words of consciousness didn't even enter into her ears. She was oblivious to consciousness because she was mesmerized by wisdom. And Vishnu says, hey, it's got to be both. You've got to be sakar in wisdom and nirakar in consciousness. You can't just be one. You are the Shakti, the Divine Mother Energy. You have to illuminate both of us. And now because of that, we have some karma to do. We're both going to do the karma. You go become a mayor, I'll become a stallion, and we'll give birth to the High High Dynasty. High High means the Horse Dynasty. Samaji, a question from Nanda from San Jose. Namaste, Nandama. Namaste Swamiji, why would Jaya and Vijaya, who are devotees of Vishnu, reincarnate as those that hated Vishnu? What can we learn from this? Uh, Nanda, they had the choice. They could take seven births as Rishis and always remember Vishnu, or they could take three births as Asuras and be antagonistic to Vishnu. Now, they decided that it would be easier to get the karma over with quickly. Who wants to go down and be a, a human being? seven times. So they chose to become Asuras. Uh, what can we learn from this? I think we're, if I was ever given the choice, I read Maino Rishi all the time. Uh, that's the lesson for me. I don't know, maybe you can make your own choice. How do you want to live your life? As an Asura or as a Rishi? Possibly that's the choice you're given. Every one of us, when you have to come down to earth, how do you want to live your life? Do you want to live it as an Asura? Me! More for me! Or do you want to live it as a Rishi? Thee, I bow to thee. Those are the distinctions. It's a choice. Each one of us is given. Every time we're cursed to come into manifestation. We didn't finish karma, so we got to come back. That's the curse. You're going to get the fruit of your karma. That's the curse. Or it's a blessing. And the blessing is, if I do good things, I'm going to get the good fruit that I choose. And the curse is, I don't want the fruit of my karma. I want the fruit of someone else's karma. I like to have Srima's karma. <laughs> Each one of us gets to make the choice. Do you want to come back as an Asura or do you want to come back as a, a Rishi? Samaji, question from Wendy from New Jersey. Namaste, Wendy Ma. Can you please help us understand the following words? Uh, samadhi, enlightenment, realization, and self-realization. Do they refer to the same state of being or are they somehow different? They are different and some quite divergent. Samadhi is a state of consciousness and it's a transient state, it's not permanent. 
And there are many different kinds of samadhi. Now, uh, there's a bob samadhi, that's a feeling of being me with my deity. And there's a savikalpa samadhi, where there's just the two of us. And there's a nirvikalpa samadhi, where there's just the one of you. And then after the samadhi, we come back into waking consciousness and it's business as usual. We have a body and we have to function as human beings function. Now, realization and self-realization, that's uh, more subjective. Uh, realization could be uh, a, a, any realization that we have, Wendy, uh, I realize that you and Sam were such beautiful people. Even just being in your presence for the weekend was such a joy to me. That was a realization. But having self-realization usually implies that I realize that I'm a beautiful person. And that I'm wonderful to be with, not just for the weekend, but I like it here. This is a nice place to be. Now, enlightenment is even more subjective because as many people as you ask, so many responses will you receive. And uh, it, it really uh, it defies definition. How can any one of us say that I have measured the limits of infinity for all time? It's impossible. So usually enlightenment is something that I would say about people I respect very highly as the examples that I want to follow. My guru is enlightened. <laughs> because I see in her example a, a way of life, a pattern of being that I want to inculcate into my own life, Wendy. So I think that my a definition of enlightenment, uh, my application of enlightenment as applied to my gurus is more important than my calling myself enlightened because uh, that's uh, just uh, tantamount to my saying, and by the way, aren't I the most humble of all the beings? <laughs> Because I have this self-realization and I have measured infinity for all time and further, for all eternity. <laughs> so the qualification of being, I am enlightened, that's an absurdity in its face. My assumption or my ascription to, of enlightenment to those who I love and want to follow and wish to emulate gives greater inspiration to me and says that's a, that these are reasons why I want to follow that example. Uh, so those terms are very different and they're used differently by different people. Michael has a follow-up question. Yes, Michael, please. And namaste, Karen. He's saying, uh, Swamiji, can you please describe the feeling of attachment and how does attachment affect the stream of pure consciousness? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, attachment is the feeling of I and mine and possession. And um, it, it limits the pure stream of pure consciousness because my perception is clouded through my perspective. I can only see things through my perspective according to my likes and dislikes. And so here I am attracted to the objects of my attachment and I feel tremendous pleasure when I get them and I feel pain when they're gone from me and now I, re I ignore and neglect the, the rest of creation and the rest of uh, the creation's opinions about what I'm attached to. The objects of my attachment are particular to me. So, Michael, that's how I feel about attachment. <laughs> I'm attached, I'm attracted, and I'm pleased when I get my way. And conversely, when I don't get my way, I'm not nice to be around. <laughs> Ask anybody, they'll tell you that Swami is a, is a mean guy. So it, it, the attachment 
uh, obscures the wisdom and the universality of our stream of consciousness because of our subjectivity. We have only opinions, and those opinions all have one reference, me. And that's ego eye. And that's why we're trying to surrender our attachments into the light of wisdom and then make ourselves free as we can, <laughs> freer and freer, until we are free from attachment, free from subjectivity, free from attach att attraction to selfish desires. A question from yesterday about Shiva and Parvati. Yes, please. From Kumari. In the Chandi story, after the gods propitiate Parvati, Ambika emerges from Parvati, after which Parvati becomes black and returns to the mountains and is known as Kalika. Please comment on what is happening here. Why black? And is this Kalika the Kali worship today? Yes, yes she is. She becomes Ambi, the mother of all. She is Parvati. She becomes Gauri. She was rays of light. And then she becomes dark. She's both darkness and light. She's unknowable because she's black. I mean, that means we can't know anything about her. And she's also taken away all of our darkness. And then she becomes so beautiful. That darkness, even radiating darkness, she becomes so beautiful that self-conceit and self-deprecation are told by their spies, uh, passion and anger, hey, there's that beautiful lady illuminating the whole Himalayas. She'll take away all the darkness. You should have her as your Shakti, your... Your self-conceit will have no limitations when the energy of the universe is the Shakti which inspires your self-conceit. And that's what happens in the fifth chapter when Mother manifests in the Himalayas. Om Sam Saraswati Maha Namaste